Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the Western Landowners Alliance Winter Webinar Series. We have almost 500 people registered for this webinar. And so it's gonna take just a few moments to get everybody logged in here. We're at about 95 participants. Um, so I'll just go ahead and introduce myself as folks get on board here. Uh, my name is Monique DiGiorgio. I'm with the Western Landowners Alliance and I am the Western Water Program Director. And just a friendly reminder that when you signed up and registered for this webinar today, we automatically um, made you a member um, in our growing membership database. And we do rely on support from members like you. So if you had it in your heart of hearts to give us a donation, um, we sure would appreciate it. There's a QR code there um, on your screen. And then Jake Lebsack, our water resources coordinator, um, just put a link in the chat there if you'd like to support our work. So thanks for that. And again, welcome everyone. We've got about 140 people joining us right now. Um, we're gonna wait just one more minute before we get started. Um, thanks for joining our winter webinar series. Uh, we have about 500 people signed up. And so probably when we get to a little over 250 folks joining us today, we'll just go ahead and get going. And uh, we are recording this today. I think you probably saw a prompt when you logged on. So if you missed the first part of this or for folks that weren't able um, to attend, we will record this and put this on our website um, so that you can stay in touch. And again, we are a membership-based organization and that QR code is there for you to support us if you would like to. Thank you for that. Um, the other thing too, as uh, you are logging on today, thanks for joining us. Please go ahead and put your name and affiliation and maybe what state you're representing in the chat here. Um, we have almost 500 people registered. There are about 15 states represented, um, not just Western states. We had some East Coast states as well. And um, because this is such a big webinar with so many folks, unfortunately, we can't see all of your beautiful faces, um, but we would love for you to put your name and your affiliation and maybe your state in the chat um, and just let us know who you are. And that will be the way that we can all get to know each other. And then Jake Lebsack is in the chat there helping to moderate our resources. We're at about 173 participants. So I think we're gonna go ahead and get started because we have a lot to cover. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining our first Friday winter webinar series. My name is Monique DiGiorgio. I'm the Western Water Program Director here at Western Landowners Alliance. I'm in Durango, Colorado, um, in the Colorado River Basin. It's really my honor to um, be part of this water team. And I'd like to introduce the rest of our team. Um, Danny Howlett is the Outreach and Membership Coordinator and she's waving from Montana and she's um, who you've been Hearing from in terms of uh, our invites and everything else, Lewis Wirtz is the communications director, hailing from Denver, Colorado, as is Jake Lebsack, who is our water resources coordinator. He is also hailing from Denver, Colorado. And uh, Leslie Allison from Santa Fe, New Mexico. She is our CEO. And I'm gonna let Leslie give you a brief introduction of WLA, who we are and why our work is so important. And you're getting applause already, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Uh, wonderful to have you all here. I love seeing all the interest in this topic. It's such an incredibly important topic for the West. And I think there's a tremendous amount that landowners and land stewards uh, can do uh, to, to help the West in facing some of the real challenges that we have today. So we're excited to, to bring you this series. Um, so I'm Leslie Allison. I'm the CEO of Western Landowners Alliance. And we are a Westwide landowner-led organization, and we're dedicated to keeping the working lands of the West whole and healthy for the benefit of both people and wildlife. And our approach is a generally collaborative, uh, constructive, solutions-oriented, and we work to support landowners in taking care of these landscapes that are important to all of us. Uh, we work in several different areas, 
We help connect landowners with one another through peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, we have so much knowledge within the land uh, landowner, land manager community that we all don't often get a chance to share that knowledge on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. So that's a very high priority for us. Uh, we also try to connect landowners and managers with relevant uh, science and information to help inform their management decisions. Um, we also try to help support uh, landowners and managers with the resources they need to manage successfully. And those resources include things like money, federal funding, economic opportunities, um, as well as developing the skilled labor that is necessary to success. And then finally, and very importantly, developing the public policies, the public understanding and support that we need to be uh, successful as a, as a community. Um, so those are the three areas we work. We have uh, focal areas in economics, water, wildlife, and forest and rangeland management. Those things all flow together. Uh, we're privileged, lucky to have a phenomenal team uh, across the West. We um, have uh, representation in many of the Western states uh, in our staff, um, and uh, each brings a different set of skills and expertise to support uh, landowners and managers um, in, in, in their work. So with that, I think I'll uh, turn it back to you, Monique. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Leslie. And so with that, we're so pleased to host today our second webinar, Rancher Innovations to Support Soil Health and Water Management Amidst a Changing Climate. And our first webinar, if you missed it, um, in December was Low-Tech Stream Restoration for Landowners, the benefits, water right issues, and reducing risks. And so Jake has put our website in the chat there. You can watch all of these webinars on our website. Um, so now I would love to um, introduce our panelists um, or presenters. So Heather Lewin with the Roaring Fork Conservancy. She is the Science and Policy Director at Roaring Fork Conservancy. Recent projects include Crystal River restoration at Riverfront Park and Frying Pan River winter flow enhancements. She enjoys the opportunity to bring together diverse groups of stakeholders to learn and work cooperatively. And Seth Mason, of Lodic Hydrological. He is the principal hydrologist at Lodic Hydrological, a consulting firm based in Carbondale, Colorado, that's dedicated to providing clients with data tools and interpretations necessary to inform science-based decision-making, public policy development, and natural resource management. Seth specializes in hydrological modeling, stream characterization, deployment and operation of remote data collection and management systems, data visualization and development of water management master plans. Thanks so much, Seth, um, for being here. Brendan Doran of Turnabout Ranch. Brendan grew up ranching in Route County and recently relocated his family to the Turnabout Ranch in Carbondale, which he owns and operates with a focus on pasture restoration and custom agriculture. In addition to managing the 400 acre 480 acre ranch and 2,500 acre BLM permit, Brendan enjoys spending time with his wife and 15-month-old son, teaching skiing and hunting. Well-rounded individual with really great artwork behind you. <laughs> you, get the, you get the award for the best backdrop. So thank you so much to our um, presenters. And Heather, I'm going to let you uh, kick it off. Sure thing. Thanks, Monique. I'm going to hopefully share screen here um, so we can take a look at this slideshow. Um, well, that's coming up. Thank you all for having us here. We're really excited to get the chance to talk with everyone about this project. It's um, something a little outside the box for us. Um, some great innovations and some great partners. So um, let's see if we can get the presentation to roll here. Here we are. Okay, so um, first, yep, I'm Heather Lewin from Roaring Fork Conservancy. I'm our Science and Policy Director um, with folks from it sounds like all over the West and maybe all over the country. I just wanted to orient us real quick to where we're located. Um, so the left side, there's the map of Colorado. You kind of see the blue blob um, kind of in the center Western part of Colorado. That's where we're located. Um, the watershed itself spans from the headwaters just above Aspen of the Roaring Fork River down to where it meets the Colorado River in Glenwood Springs. Um, towns of Basalt, Carbondale, um, Glenwood and Aspen, and then we've got two major tributaries coming into the Roaring Fork, um, the Crystal River and the Frying Pan, known a lot in this area for 
recreation, um, skiing and fishing in particular. So Roaring Fork Conservancy, um, just as a background as to who we are, we're a watershed group and a nonprofit organization. Um, we're not a regulatory entity, and in spite of the name, we are not a water conservation district. Um, so we are a nonprofit founded in 1996 with the mission to uh, help people explore, value, and protect the Roaring Fork watershed. Um, in a broad swoop, our we have education and science and policy programs. Our education programs range from preschool through college age programs, as well as community based and outdoor explorations. And on the science and policy side, where we're looking at water quantity, water quality, and habitat protection. So, how does a watershed group end up paired up um, with landowners and ranchers? And I think historically, this is sort of an unlikely partnership that we've seen too much between um, what's historically seen as environmental groups and ranching groups. But lately, it seems we're finding a lot more common grounds and a lot more common goals in, um, in what we're doing. And so on, from our side in a watershed organization, we really see the value of local agriculture to the community, to the economy, and to the open spaces. Um, agricultural land provides us a valuable habitat, migration corridor for wildlife and birds, and importantly, um, we believe the alternatives to losing agri productive agricultural land are detrimental to our community values, to our ecosystem values, and to our watersheds as a whole. If we lose agriculture, the alternatives are usually a buy and dry or hardscape development. And so continuing productive agriculture in the agricultural community is favorable to dust, weeds, and hardscape um, from what we've seen in our watershed so far. So what brought us here to the current project about three years ago, our board president who was raised on a farm in Iowa started to talk to us a bit more about the idea of soil health and that how that might tie into our work and water issues in our valley. Um, naturally, we reached out to Seth and Jessica with Lodic Hydrological, and they worked with us to design the original study plan that they'll be describing shortly here for you. So, as we've seen so far this winter, with the abundance of uh, brown outside, even here in the high mountains, rather than snow, um, the common ground that was pretty easily found between the ranching community and a watershed group is concerns over persistent drought and lack of water resources. So with reduced access to water, whether it's through a physical lack of water due to drought or through administration and water rights, the question that we're working to answer or to better understand, is there a way that, can, that improved soil health can help mitigate the impacts of reduced water and benefit post-drought recovery? So with that said, this, um, as was alluded to earlier, this project was really a, a partnership um, between Roaring Fork Conservancy, Lodic Hydrological, and the study design. And, and the really integral piece is these landowners, um, landowners and water rights holders who really helped us fine tune the design, provided insights to how the study could look on the ground, um, but most importantly, Importantly, put in hours and hours of manpower and labor into making all this happen. Brennan will has some great photos showing you exactly how this went on the ground just a few months ago. Um, but their willingness to work with a group like ours to provide land and water to try something new and outside the box to take a risk that might or might not show a benefit, um, but to really help us and to help them and hopefully help others figure out and better understand ways to keep vibrant agriculture in our community under these constrained water conditions. So with that large bit of gratitude, I'm gonna pass this over to Seth and Jessica um, to discuss the study design. Great, thank you, Heather. Um, as Heather mentioned, my name is Seth Mason uh, with Lodic Hydrological and Jessica is here with me today. Um, we assisted the Roaring Fork Conservancy in the uh, technical aspects of this particular project, really building out the, uh, the treatment approaches, the data collection and monitoring approaches. And then as it turned out over this last uh, summer, uh, Jessica ended up in the field a lot with uh, the various uh, ranchers, including Brendan, 
uh, to actually implement the study. So we're here today just to give you the, the, the dry information uh, about the, the kind of technical aspects of the study, how we set it up, uh, where the study plots exist, uh, et cetera. We'll go to the next slide. All right, good. Okay. So um, for this study, we ended up with four study locations across the Roaring Fork watershed. Uh, those locations are indicated by the, the red pins here. You can see we have uh, one location on the upper right that is in the frying, the upper frying pan watershed. Uh, the location in the lower right uh, is in the Roaring Fork. Uh, watershed near the town of Basalt. Uh, continuing on to the lower left, we have Brendan's Ranch in the Crystal River drainage. <laughs> and then the upper left uh, is another location um, that is in the, the Roaring Fork drainage. These four sites uh, span the, the variety of elevations that we see in the Roaring Fork watershed where agricultural production is taking place um, and that's kind of critical to us. We also span some of the, the dominant soil types as well. Um, three of these locations are private, privately owned ranches uh, and one is an agricultural parcel owned by Pitkin County. All four locations are under active agricultural production. They are grass hay and alfalfa uh, fields and that was particularly important to this study, um, the, the dominant agricultural activity by land area in Western Colorado is for grass hay and alfalfa production. And, and we were particularly interested in, uh, in, that, uh, in that type of agricultural activity. Um, as Heather mentioned, uh, the, the conservancy was, was integral here to you know, making contacts with landowners, leveraging existing collaborative relationships with landowners to make this uh, study possible. And it was only through the, the generous uh, participation and contributions of those landowners that, that we were able to do any of this work. Let's go to the next slide. So for each of the, the study sites, we set out uh, to uh, respond to the, the objective that, that Heather mentioned, which is really to understand um, how different soil treatments uh, could aid in uh, improving soil health and, and reducing impacts of limited uh, water application, uh, reducing impacts of drought. And the treatments that we selected were um, informed by our interest in identifying scalable solutions. Uh, so rather than identifying a, um, a solution that might be highly effective uh, in, a, in a garden plot, for example, at meeting the objective, but uh, unreasonable to scale up uh, across hundreds of acres, we, we attempted to select treatment types and application methods that would be accessible both in terms of equipment and uh, cost to your average rancher in the Roaring Fork watershed. So the treatments uh, that we applied included soil aeration, a biochar amendment, and deficit irrigation. Uh, the soil aeration treatment is expected to reduce soil compaction and encourage water infiltration. So the impact there on um, uh, mitigating against the effects of drought should be um, self-evident. And that work was conducted with a, a pasture aerator, which is a, kind of a, a relatively low-tech uh, implement and Brendan will talk to you about that uh, in a little bit. The biochar amendment uh, was uh, included as um, uh, a means for for really kind of changing the the microbial activity in the soil column for for changing nutrient dynamics in the soil column, uh, reducing nitrogen losses, and and generally just boosting productivity. Uh, across these acreages. Um, as we set out initially in this project, we were very interested. There's a, there's a biomass power uh, generation plant uh, very, very close by. And as a, uh, a byproduct of power generation there, they um, 
produce a, a waste stream of biochar. And so initially we were, we were particularly interested in utilizing that waste stream um, as the amendment here um, due to some complications in, in contracting with, with that plant that didn't work out. Uh, nonetheless, we were able to secure that, that biochar um, from a supplier in Colorado. And then we topically applied that to the aerated soil with a manure spreader at uh, approximately 12 cubic yards per acre. The other treatment uh, is related to irrigation. We, um, uh, in, the, in the coming season, will apply a deficit irrigation strategy to some portions of our study sites uh, to mimic drought impacts. And that deficit irrigation approach will entail an, an irrigation shutoff at a selected date early in the summer months. Next slide. Well, this one did not come across well in the slide for some reason. Um, apologies for that. This slide is intended to help you understand how it is that we laid out the treatments on our uh, study sites. So at each study site, we had uh, or we uh, delineated six half acre uh, plots and um, we applied the aeration treatment to two of those half acre plots. We applied aeration and biochar to two of those half acre plots. And then two of the plots were our control plots. So no treatment applied there, no soil health amendment. Um, and then we have two irrigation strategies. So three of the half, half acre plots will receive deficit irrigation in the coming year, and three will receive kind of the typical or, or full irrigation that you would expect. Next slide. Over the course of the summer, uh, we, uh, over the course of this last summer, we uh, conducted baseline monitoring. And then this coming summer, we'll, we'll conduct monitoring associated with uh, the treatments themselves. That monitoring includes field measurements, remote sensing measurements, and biomass sampling. Uh, the field measurements included uh, characterization of soil moisture, an aggregated measure of soil moisture in the, in the upper uh, horizon. Um, we collected samples, soil samples, and had them analyzed by a lab to characterize soil health. Some of the parameters that we evaluated are, are noted here and included pH, organic matter, uh, major uh, nutrients, micronutrients, and cation exchange. Uh, we will be, over the coming summer, collecting data with uh, UAVs, so with, with drones, measuring remotely uh, NDVI, which is a, a measure of plant greenness and evapotranspiration from the, the crop itself. And then over the course of the summer, uh, as we did last summer, uh, we will continue to evaluate crop yield on all of our plots. Um, we will also continue to measure dominant cover species and percent weed species. And then we will send uh, forage samples to a lab and have those samples analyzed uh, for forage quality, which includes measures of uh, crude protein, fiber, fat, digestible nutrients, and relative feed value. Next slide. Let me go to the next slide. All right, very good. So I wanted to give you a sense of the uh, the sampling as it takes place in the field, the actual sampling design on each of these plots. Uh, so I mentioned in 2023, this last summer, we conducted baseline monitoring on all of these plots. No treatments were uh, applied during the course of monitoring. Uh, treatment application occurred late in the fall. So just as uh, everything was, was wrapping up, um, uh, agriculturally in the Roaring Fork watershed. Mm -hmm. We went out and, and applied the treatments. And then this coming summer will be the, the monitoring and data analysis associated with the, the treatments themselves. Um, the monitoring at each site um, is, is, is conducted as uh, characterized by this 
uh, graphic here in each one half acre plot. Uh, we divide that plot into quadrants and then each quadrant is divided into quadrats and random samples uh, are, are collected from each of those. And the, the sampling occurs in a couple different ways, depending on what's being collected. Uh, soil moisture probe, that's an in situ measure with a handheld device. Uh, the um, uh, crop yield and, and forage quality data is collected by uh, clipping the vegetation in a one meter square, as you see here in the, in the photo on the right. Uh, and, uh, and that information is, is shipped off to the lab. And then the, uh, the, the soil health uh, sample, the, the soil samples for evaluating soil health are, are collected uh, with a, with a, a handheld drill. Um, but this generally is how the data collection looks. Um, at each, for each sampling date, we then end up with 24 samples across our six plots. And between, um, between dates, you move uh, around the, the quadrants within the, um, within the plot so that you're always sampling a, a new quadrant with each uh, sampling event. Okay, next slide. The analysis that we will conduct after all data is collected over the course of the coming summer will uh, attempt to identify treatment effects. So we really want to understand what is the overall impact of irrigation curtailment on our control plots. And then we want to understand what kind of yield, we expect that there will be a yield reduction, right? That, that shouldn't be news to anybody. If you apply less water in these water limited um, environments, you will likely grow less crop. Um, so what we really want to understand with regard to the treatments is what kind of yield reduction offset is produced by aeration alone or by the aeration plus biochar treatment. Uh, then we will conduct a, a simple, simple economic evaluation and we'll look at the cost of those treatments. So what's the, the cost of, of diesel fuel associated with pasture aeration? And then what's the, co the added cost of uh, biochar application? And how do those costs compare to the economic loss offsets produced by those treatments? And that the economic loss offset uh, will be calculated simply as a, as a production or as a function of the, uh, the yield, the dry weight of the crop produced and, the, um, and the, the price of hay in the coming season. So that gives you a, a sense of what we uh, did in terms of the study design, the data that's being collected. We don't have results for you currently, but we hope to have the opportunity to come back to you in a year's time and and give you uh, some sense of, of what we learned. But uh, we do have some interesting uh, perspectives on project participation that Brennan's going to share with us. I think uh, in terms of the application and the doing of this stuff, there are already a, a wealth of lessons learned. So Brennan, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, and thanks to Jessica, Seth, and Heather for putting this all together and uh, reaching out to us uh, for participation and, and doing some work on it. Um, as you can see in this photo, uh, there's some pretty decent uh, thistle. Uh, we purchased uh, our ranch a few years ago, and it was a uh, it was overgrazed, uh, and so there was a, a need for some significant uh, rejuvenation, if you will. So when I was um, spoken with about the possibility of this project, we, we kind of leapt to it um, for multiple reasons, uh, one being that we we had the majority of the equipment uh, already, uh, knowing that I was going to need to do this uh, um resting and rejuvenation and restoration project of the ranch anyways. Uh, so it was uh, kind of a perfect storm of uh, of being in the right place at the right time uh, for us uh, and Heather and Seth and, and Jessica coming and, uh, and seeking us out. So um, can I grab the next slide, please? 
So <laughs> one of the challenges that we faced right off the bat, and Jessica worked tirelessly on uh, securing the biochar and getting it here, uh, was the fact that it came in a van trailer. And thankfully, it came to us first as opposed to the other sites, because between the pallet jacks and the uh, and the skid steer, we were able to move all of the uh, all of the biochar to the tailgate of the of the truck to get it unloaded. Uh, it was a little bit rough uh, getting it off, lots of broken pallets, different things like that. So in the future, we would probably request a uh, a flatbed uh, trailer, flat trailer to uh, deliver it to make the ease of of unloading it uh, much better for us. In in that regard, it uh, it was challenging, but we got it done. Um, so these bags come; they're about a thousand pounds and roughly, and so they were fairly brittle, uh, and we had to take a, a lot of care in handling them. Uh, I think they were kind of sitting somewhere for a little bit longer than they than they should have been. Uh, so we got it done, though. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So the way that the process worked, it was a little bit challenging for certain uh, for certain things. As you can see, the upper left hand corner uh, picture. Some of the bags broke apart, so getting uh, getting a loader underneath them or getting them on pallets to be able to get them in, uh, we had to work our way way through things and sometimes bring some different equipment than we we had on site just to make it a little bit easier to uh, to get the job done. The right hand picture is from the upper frying pan valley. Um, uh, or excuse me, the upper frying pan watershed. Uh, that was uh, quite challenging for Jessica and company to get uh, there due to the narrowness of the valley and how things were were uh, had to be transported up a, a pretty pretty steep driveway. But Jessica got it done in the long run, um, which was fantastic. And so so some of the things that uh, that we learned uh, in the future if folks are, are wanting to move forward with a similar project please reach out to us because we can uh, we can save you some tears I guess for lack of a better term um, can I go ahead get the next slide please great so this is um, the shippy open space so this is the parcel that was in the uh, area of Elgebel basalt um, you're actually looking at the hill in the background, the skyline was where the late Christine fire was. Uh, what was that now? Seven, eight years ago, maybe. Um, and then the lower area there is the frying pan valley. Um, so what we did here was we got everybody together in a convoy. Uh, Jessica led us off with flashing lights because that aerator is uh, 16 feet wide. Um so getting things from our ranch to to the spaces we had to to kind of band together and and make sure that we were covered because as you guys can imagine and all of you know unfortunately nowadays people don't really uh break for tractors um along the way of course we got passed by an electric car on a double yellow line um so so it was uh it was just uh fittings so this is our aeration at the shippy open space and what our goal was here when the and everywhere primarily is that we would like to aerate it perpendicular to the natural runoff flow or the irrigation flow to try and get more and more uh soil uh disturbance in the right direction for retention of moisture um and I can go ahead and go to the next slide. So this is a little bit closer look at the aerator. Um, it's uh, it's an airway brand. The left picture is in our shop and the left picture shows the aerator and there'll be another slide in a second. Shows the aerator with a 10 degree offset, if you can see that. So it actually hinges in the middle uh, and then pins on the outside. So the, the machine will go from a zero to a five to a 10 degree um, offset. And we, for this study, did everything in a straight offset uh, or straight line, no offset. 
for the reason that the uh, upper frying pan project, we couldn't get the 16 foot aerator in there. So Jessica secured an eight foot rigid aerator. Uh, so in an effort to keep the, the study consistent, we went ahead and straightened ours out as well so that everything was the same, same way. Uh, the right hand picture, as you can see my finger pointing to that, that's roughly between, depending on the offset, because it goes a little bit deeper with with uh, in line with the offset straight, we were in between seven and nine inches of depth in aeration, uh, which was pretty darn good considering as dry and unmaintained as these parcels that we were working on uh, were. All the parcels were uh, used for agriculture and grazing. Uh, but none of them had had anything uh, done like this in quite some time. Uh, so they were very compacted. And that's why we use the ballast on the top of the aerator. So the, the aerator actually weighs about 6,000 pounds. And then the concrete blocks on top of the aerator, 1,000 pounds each. So we were pulling 10,000 uh, in the ground just to stick it in, get it, get it to set in that far. Um, just for anyone that, that wanted to know that that tractor pulling the 15 foot, the 16 foot airway, that's a John Deere 8200. So it's pulling in at about 205 horsepower. Uh, and depending on where you are, it takes all 205 horsepower to pull it. Uh, at the upper frying pan location, we used an eight foot rigid uh, aerator. The, the tines on that one were not knew it was a rental unit but we ran that with a john deere 7410 which comes in at 105 horsepower we left it there for the property owner to do some aeration on their own and as you saw in a previous picture they run a 6410 and uh, speaking with the the operator it was all that the 6410 had in it to pull that uh, eight foot aerator at that elevation. Uh, so there's some fairly significant horsepower requirements needed, uh, depending on where you're at and what you're doing. Um, so next slide. Uh, yeah, here. So this is the, this is the upper frying pan location and that's, that's our 7410 pulling it, uh, on the side hill, uh, smaller rigid, obviously just takes more time. And so, uh, so we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. When we got to the biochar spreading, uh, we probably, I would say, and Jessica will, will probably agree with me. We learned the most about the process in this, uh, in this, this portion of the project, as you can see on the left, just your typical manure spreader. And we utilized that because honestly, it's what we had and it's what we could secure. Uh, Seth and Jessica used a drop spreader, as you can see on the right hand side, um, which the drop spreader worked well, uh, we found out, but the hard part was the loading it and the biochar application being three tons to the acre, as you can imagine with the small hopper on that, uh, on that drop spreader, you really can't keep up with refilling it. Um, so in comes the middle picture of a dry fertilizer spreader. And we tried to secure a dry fertilizer spreader, but it, it just didn't work out for us. Um, and moving forward, a, um, a six ton or an eight ton uh, dry fertilizer spreader with double augers that is a uh, hydraulically controlled uh, tailgate, I think would be the most efficient use um, to get the most consistency. As you can imagine, the uh, drag chains that are in the left picture of the uh, manure spreader, things were coming out somewhat inconsistently. Um, the only thing we did do on our ranch is after the fact, we did go ahead and run a spring tooth harrow through it to just try and spread things a little bit more evenly um, because we did get some some inconsistency, but we did the best that we could with, uh, with what we were uh, able to put together uh, on this one. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I just added this slide. This is this is our our ranch, and if you can see, um, this is a maximum offset. So this is a ten degree offset. You can see where kind of the center of the screen is the uh, is the center of the aerator, and then there's the V shaped um, going up the hill slightly at that angle. Um, this I found historically um, having done pasture restoration basically my whole life, that 10 degree offset is a mild cultivation that really does a good job of loosening up the soil and compacting it. Um, on this uh, particular field, I went straight up and downhill, uh, knowing that I'm going to go at probably a, a 22 and a half degree offset from this next spring uh, so that we are double down, doubling down on aeration twice a year um, the, the ranch was, was, as I said, very overgrazed and the, uh, the compaction was pretty significant, uh, on this field, especially I did not get the aerator in the ground more than five inches on this field, believe it or not, uh, with all that weight and everything, just because of the compaction in the soil. Uh, next slide, if we have another one. Ah, uh, yeah, here's a great one. So, uh, obviously the picture on the left um, is my handprint. And then, uh, there's one of the aeration slices. And then the picture on the right, um, is, as you can see, the inconsistencies in the spreading of the biochar, uh, left has some biochar, right has a significant, significantly more biochar. Um, and that's the reason that we went ahead and used the, uh, the English harrow, uh, at our place to get a little more consistent uh, spreading of it where it where it did clump up a little bit coming out of the manure spreader. Um, next slide, please. If we have one. Ah, okay. So yeah, so there there you can see that's the that's the tractor that we use for the large uh, large aerator, um, and we. Uh, we we had fun doing it. I'll I'll tell you I was I was pretty excited about it. The agriculture here in the Roaring Fork Valley is not as significant as it is in in Route County where I'm from. Uh, so I, I kind of leapt at the idea of being able to to get back into uh, the pasture restoration somewhere other than just uh, our own place, uh, and also the idea of of moving forward. Because as we know, uh, ranchers uh, get stuck in their ways and th there probably is a better way. And we we wanted to, uh, when presented with this, we wanted to be uh, participants uh, in in moving forward, uh, in understanding more than anything, in, in having the data on, on what's going to work for us long term, what's going to make our irrigation more efficient so that a, we we can not only potentially turn some water back to the river, um, but we can also use the water that we have more efficiently and and make it go more places. Um, so I think uh, that about wraps up where I am at with uh, the process. Uh, so I will go ahead and uh, send things back to Monique. Thank you so much, Brendan, and that aerator is so cool. It would have been really fun to be out there on the ground with you, um, figuring all that out. So thank you so much to Brendan, Seth, and Heather. And we see lots of great questions coming in in the Q&A um, kind of section of Zoom. So if you have questions for any of the presenters, go ahead and please put those in the chat. And then what I'm gonna do is, and in the Q&A function or the chat, Jake will moderate both. Um, I'm just gonna kick us off because we have some really good questions. Um, we're gonna take the next 15 minutes to answer and ask some questions and then wrap up around one. Um, so let's start with Seth. Seth, a question from Claudia. Is underground biomass included in monitoring? Was it considered? Um, underground biomass is not directly measured um, through any of our any of our monitoring. Um, there, of course, are a myriad of different ways that you might think to evaluate both soil health and impacts on on the crop itself. Um, we made some decisions uh, that were motivated by budget constraints um, and and did not include that. But good question. 
Thank you. Yeah, we have a lot of really good <laughs> detailed questions here. So the next one um, for Brendan, but obviously um, Heather and Seth and all the panelists, you guys can jump in if you have other thoughts, but um, kind of directed towards Brendan. Was the half acre plot size in your sampling scheme large enough to capture variation in soil properties? Would these results be as robust as smaller replicated plots? This is a question from Anthony. Um, I, that's a great question. Um, you know, the, the variability in soil across a field, as any rancher will tell you, is a is a pretty dominant control on on the on the quality of the crop that you might expect from one end to the other. Um, do we are we confident that we've captured all of the variability that occurs on each of these study sites with our plots? No. Um, could we have captured additional variability with a much higher uh, count of plots that were smaller in size? Yes, uh, if they were distributed more broadly across the pasture. The challenge there is uh, really in the application of the treatments, uh, particularly, you, you know, you're looking at this picture here with the aerator. Um, you know, it's not trivial to aerate um, even six acres on each of these sites. And so again, um, and, and you know, it, it wouldn't be possible to do this kind of aeration on you know one meter plot, a one meter plot, and then lift it up and then go do it on another one meter plot. That sort of um, application would be, I think, frustrating, challenging. And so again, another place where we kind of looked at um, the the study design in its entirety and evaluated. Um, you know, Brendan's time and willingness to participate and donate equipment and um, decided that the, the best thing to do was to keep uh, larger plots uh, and um, simplify the, the application. But great. Yep. Great question. And it just, I'll, I'll add one more uh, point here for you all. And that is, you know, th this is, this is work that is, um, you know, this is kind of applied science. We're not doing um, groundbreaking academic research here. Um, we're we're testing these methods um, that have been shown in some locations to be effective and others to be less effective. Uh, we're testing them here in the Roaring Fork to see how well uh, they play out. And as we had discussions with funders, uh, there was a lot of concern about any approach that would be more focused on uh, mesocosms or, or small plots, and, and they were particularly interested in making sure that we were demonstrating the scalability in the application of the treatments themselves. Uh, so there was some motivation from the um, from at least one of the funders for this project to do things at scale in the in the design of the treatments themselves. Okay, thank you so much. Um, another more technical question for anyone to dive in, either Seth Brendan or Heather. Um, how did you determine the soil was compacted enough that aeration was a meaningful practice to employ? This is from Rob. Um, I, I can go ahead and field that. And just on the heels of, uh, of Seth's comments, you know, as far as uh, the Turnabout Ranch goes, I chose the site very specifically as uh, the site that I saw the least productivity and the the uh, the the least healthy soil and that's why we we went ahead and and had Jessica use that area so there was a, the motivation for us was uh, that we felt like we could really tell the difference uh, in things where we picked it um and then can you re-ask that question I apologize. <laughs> No, I think, I think you answered it. And then, um, so I'll just, yeah, I think that was a great, great answer. And then I'll just go on to the next one. We have so many. Um, Seth mentioned a simple economic evaluation. Any idea how much the biochar application plus aeration cost is on a per acre basis? This is Tony at Montana State University. Good question, Tony. And I'm going to, I'm going to give you a number and, um, and you're going to, raise your eyebrows, and then I'm going to explain <laughs> um, how we ended up here. Um, so the the rough cost is is looking like about $2,000 an acre. 
And so if you if you think about applying that over you know a 600 acre ranch, um, those costs are are significant. They're very, they're very large. Um, I mentioned that initially in the study design, we were hoping to utilize a waste stream from a from a local power generation plant, uh, which essentially would have dropped that cost to free. Um, that was the that was the hope. That was the design that we had a the intent of of showing you know some some benefit to the the biomass plant as well as benefit to the local producers. Um, but we didn't end up there. So there may be opportunity locally for us to continue to pursue that, uh, which could drastically change the the calculus. Um, but if you are producing biochar, or excuse me, securing biochar from uh, as we did production facilities down near Denver, um, that is the, you know, the, the cost for that material is rather high. Yes. And um, I have one burning question that I'm going to interject as a composter here in Durango. Um, biochar is really expensive. It's an incredible product. I'm wondering, did you consider compost as potentially part of the project and the study, um, especially as ag, you know, agricultural landowners, compost is something that we have, you know, and tends to be less expensive and something we have around. Did you consider it? If not, you know, would you, would you expect similar results? Just thoughts on that. We did consider it. There was a, there, there was a uh, discussion for a while, but actually mixing compost with the biochar. So cutting biochar with compost not a huge cost savings to that approach due to the distance that the compost would have to be hauled to get it here to the Roaring Fork. And it also complicated our ability to say anything about the effectiveness of biochar on its own. And so uh, we uh, chose the simpler approach, which would ideally allow us to say something about biochar uh, as an effective or ineffective amendment uh, without necessitating additional plots, you know, additional study plots where we could do the crossover between biochar, aeration, biochar plus aeration, biochar plus manure plus aeration, right? It just, the, the study design starts to become much, much bigger. Absolutely. Okay, great, here's great question. One. Certainly, certainly is an area for, for there, this whole uh, question, I think is fertile ground for additional study. I um, mean, you could, you could imagine a bunch of different ways to do this work. We could, Imagine uh, using a 20 degree offset to do the aeration on on all the sites rather than the than zero offset, and that that might have a, a major impact. So there are all kinds of different combinations of of uh, these treatments um, that that you could think to uh, to integrate into a study. I'll I'll just give one more little bit of information here. So in in developing the study, we were um, having conversations with other folks in the ag research space, uh, folks that are working with the ag experiment station over in Grand Junction. In particular, there was a, a study uh, that was conducted this last fall where biochar was injected in much smaller quantities um, into a field using a water jet. Uh, so much lower cost per acre, much more effective incorporation into the soil profile simultaneous aeration and, and biochar application, really neat stuff. However, the equipment necessary to do that is golf course equipment that can't handle rocks and soil, is, requires six people to operate and a, and a constant feed of water. Um, so, you know, we're interested in understanding, you know, a study design like that that can show some impact on grass hay production using this very expensive, probably rather unavailable equipment. Are there ways that we can kind of build off of that and find some more approachable, more more feasible means for folks to do similar stuff at scale? Awesome. Yeah, thank you. We have three or four more really good questions. So I'm just gonna keep them coming at you. What is the annual precipitation and timing in this area? Can you intercede daikon radish to help with soil compaction? This is from Eric. Brandon, you wanna jump in? I mean, I can give a a whack at the precip number. Or oh, you're muted. The the annual precipitation, I, I don't have a number, but it's uh it's not much. <laughs> we 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 know that much, you know. We we get one or two decent sized uh rainstorms. Last year we had a long spring, uh, but as far as consistency goes, it's it's pretty uh pretty limited. As far as 
uh, adding any uh, or interceding to try and break up the soils. Uh, we have not tried that, um, to be honest with you. Um, it's uh, for us currently, we're selling our hay to a higher end equine market. And so for us having the consistency in the crop and knowing uh, and the relative feed value being very high and the protein content very high, uh, that's where we need to stay um, because that's what subsidizes our overhead annually. I do believe the ranch that's up on the frying pan, not on the um, field that we were experimenting on, but on a separate field actually has used this, the radish uh, treatment. Um, they, I think they were, they had just done that last year and we're kind of waiting to see on, on results and how that went. Now you can jump back in on the precip. It's, uh, between 16 and 20 inches per year in the Roaring Fork Valley, mostly snow in the winter. We do get some rain in the spring and then monsoon, um, monsoon rain, not last year, but most years in the late summer. Okay. Well, you know, there's like eight more really good questions and it's, it's 1256. This didn't happen on our last webinar. They're like really detailed and good. They're about biochar. Did you charge it? Where did you get it? I think what I'm going to say, since it's 1256, um, we are putting all of these resources together from the chat, the answers to the questions, and we're going to email them out to all of the registrants. And so I think what we should do for some of you, if I didn't get to your question, Jake is monitoring that. And if the if all of you presenters wouldn't mind, we would have you answer some of those questions offline and we can put them in the resources um, that we provide to everybody. And so with that, I'm gonna ask one final question, which it kills me because there's some really good ones in here. I'm so sorry. But the last one I'm gonna um, kick to Heather because I think it's really important because in these kind of innovative spaces, how this was funded and the kind of support that you were all able to receive is so important. So the question that came from, um, I think it's Tony again, Tony had a lot of great questions from MSU. How were the treatments funded, um, funder acknowledgement? Can you just tell us a little bit about how you made this happen? For sure, there was a slide in there that had funders listed on it and I probably breezed through it in an effort to kind of uh, keep moving along. But um, the original funding came from the Colorado Ag Water Alliance. Um, they kind of seeded the project to begin with, and it started rather small. And then um, with some ambitious planning and some interested landowners, we went from one site to two sites to four sites very quickly. And so additional funding came from the CWCB, from the Colorado Water Conservation Board, from the Colorado River Water Conservation District and their community funding partnership. They funded sort of an ancillary piece of this that we didn't even really talk much about today, but um, an important piece of the overall support. And then the last funder um, is Atlantic Aviation who uh, operates our local private airport and was looking to invest more in community and community related projects. And so um, we're really thankful to them for the support they put in. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, well, this was incredible. We would love to have you back in a year or whenever the time frame is that you feel like you have some study results because I think we would love to share that with our landowner community. Um, again, about 500 people signed up today, three quarters of them were landowners. And so we really appreciate your time and energy to share this peer-to-peer -peer knowledge. And I wanna let you know that our next First Friday Winter Webinar is February 2nd. Greg Peterson with the Colorado Ag Water Alliance that Heather just mentioned is talking on historical consumptive use and knowing your water rights is use it or lose it in absolute. It's gonna be so good. Um, so please join us for that. And then finally, I would like to thank our funders. We could not have made all of this happen without the Gates Family Foundation. Um, we'd also like to thank uh, those who support our water work more broadly. Conscious Bay Research, the Fund to Protect New Mexico Air, Water, and Federal Public Lands through the Santa Fe Community Foundation, Lore Foundation, and Walton Family Foundation. So thanks again, and you'll be hearing from us next week um, with a link to all these resources, and we really appreciate your time today. Have a great Friday and a great rest of your weekend. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Thank you all.